Welcome everyone to our uh, last Zoom event of the year. I have got a few slides right at the end, which um, which illustrate some of the things which we've got lined up for next year. Um, but um, this is um, the third time we've run a beekeeper's question time around Christmas in in <coughs> um, and I'm really pleased. Uh, to welcome our panelists this evening. We got Limva, who's in Wales, um, and a holder of the NDB and uh, a master beekeeper, I believe. Um, so an expert, definitely. Um, on on her, uh, sorry, on my screen on the right <laughs> is Roger Patterson, who is well known, I think, in in beekeeping circles, and Robert Pickard, who's um, emeritus professor uh, at Cardiff University, uh, and has done a lot of research in the past. So a distinguished panel, and um, your questions. So um, thank you so much for submitting questions. I've I've tried to pick out uh, ones which are of sort of general relevance. So if you sent a question. Uh, which was rather specific to your circumstances. It may it may well not appear tonight, but um, hopefully we're going to cover a range of topics. And it being winter, uh, I thought we would start with one that is uh, related to that. And uh, it goes, it's from Karen in Oakhampton in Devon. Um, Ivy honey is often considered a bane by the beekeeper if it's so bad. Why do the bees collect so much of it? Linva, would you like to start us on that one? Yeah, so this is quite an interesting question. And I wonder how much of this is actually a myth that's just perpetuated by people saying it's a bane and a problem. So my bees collect ivy honey, as I'm sure all of yours do too. It's a really important late season crop, one of the last flowering plants that they'll have the opportunity to stock up on. And I never worry about it. If, if they put it in their brood boxes, then fantastic. And I very rarely find crystallized honey in the brood box in the spring. So they are clearly using any that they do bring in. So for me, it's not a problem and I don't worry about it. Robert, how, what about your take on this? Uh, well, it's uh, as Limba says, it's a really important late source of, of nectar for the bees. <clears throat> and even if it does crystallize a little bit too readily for a beekeeper who wants to extract it, if it's accumulated, the bees can use it without any problem. They can add water to the uh, crystals if they form. And it, it's a very important uh, forage source for the bees. Um, so it shouldn't really be a problem to a beekeeper. And Roger? Uh, yeah, it's really only started uh, yielding in my area in about the last 15 years. Previous to that, um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't have any issues. It, it has caused us problems. Um, what uh, I'm finding is it very often granulates before the, the bees seal it. Um, and um, I've seen several instances of isolation starvation where they've got solid ivy honey and it's, it, it's particularly bad when you get a prolonged spell of cold weather um, when, when, when the bees um, uh, uh, can't use it and they can't get across to uh, liquid stores. So um, it, I, have, I have seen um, quite, quite a few problems. Of course, they do need water to, uh, to liquefy it which they can for a time get from within their bodies. But if they can't get out to get water, then it does give them a problem. Now, in a, a natural nest, it's, it's no issue really, because it, it's one of the last to come in and the bees can still use it while they're, while they're still uh, active. Mm. Um, so then they've got through that into the, the, the liquid stores. 
Um, interestingly, the Irish, um, or Irish plea keepers that I've spoken to, have um, had it for years and years and years. And um, when we first had it come in our area, I spoke to them about it, and they said, well, we, we don't have any problem. Interestingly, now, um, I speak to the same Irish beekeepers and they're saying, yes, it has become a problem because of the, um, the granulation. Mm. Mm. Do, you, do you have a, an, a um, solution, Roger, to the, the problems when you get, you know, the signs of isolation, starvation? Um, no, it's too late then, um, because it, it's usually cold weather. Of course, it's when the, when the bees are in tight cluster, and they won't move over it to get to other other food. What I tend to do in the autumn is if there's a heavy ivy flow, I tend to feed syrup gently at the same time. So that in my thinking that they've got um, syrup um, distributed throughout the ivy honey. And um, I haven't had too many problems. Yeah, the important thing is to set them up properly for winter, isn't it, Roger? And make sure the brood nest is below the honey stores so that when they bring in the ivy nectar, they put it above the brood nest so that as they move through the stores, they rise in the cavity and then they can't be isolated from the food stores, which can happen if the beekeeper doesn't set them up properly for winter and it puts a lot of space underneath the brood nest but not above it so yeah. so then you you've got a real risk of, of the bees migrating away from the honey store so as long as all the space for storage is above the brood nest then the bees will rise during the winter and they shouldn't get isolated from their food do, do any of the panel do as i do and have a quick look in january to to make sure that you know there isn't empty frames next to the brood with with stores on the outside no, no i i, I generally don't. leave <laughs> well alone yeah well, if, I, if i see stores stores empty empty and then the brood i i just quickly in and out mm -hmm. and move the right. action, move well, empty frames out wait a minute bob are you running the warm way or the cold way uh oh, cold way <laughs> all right okay yeah um <laughs> I was, I've, I've seen that happen with warm way because the bees move one side away from the food if, if you're not careful. Yeah. Okay. Um, Excuse me. Can I, can I, can I, can I go back, back a bit? Just to yeah. remember, um, Robert and Linva know far more about this than me, I think. But as I understand it, when honey granulates, uh, the water um, gets forced out of the crystals into the gap between the crystals. Is that right? If there is any, yes. Yeah. If, if there isn't, well, there, well, 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 obviously, obviously is. Um, that may well be why you can very often see um, granules on the on the floor of the hive. I suspect because the bees are sucking out the um, uh, the yeah. water from between the the, the, the crystals. But I uh, 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 I don't really know. Yeah. I think I think it, it's it's obviously preferable for it to be mixed with other nectars and other sugar solutions that are not going to crystallize too quickly. And that, that's obviously going to be an advantage. But the most important thing to avoid winter separation from food is to make sure that the bees get all their food stores above the existing brood nest as they come into the winter. And then they'll rise into the food. Whenever, whenever beekeepers show me bees that have been separated from the food, um, it's usually because the food is below the brood nest which is not the natural place for no, it to no, be. No. So you don't believe in nadiring? <laughs> I don't believe in putting anything underneath the brood. <laughs> okay, when, when you're coming into winter, when you're coming into winter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, related question, really. Um, you know, if we're not all that fond of ivy, uh, what can we plant for winter forage if we continue to have these warmer winters? Uh, this this beekeeper who lives in Surrey says his bees last winter had loads of Mahonia uh, in flower. Mm, that's good. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think the important thing is, is to make sure that your bees, first of all, have got plenty of winter stores in the hive and not to rely you know, on them being able to forage more in the winter. But of course, we all know they will come out 
in the winter. My bees were flying on Christmas Day last year. And there are, you know, quite a few plants that they they will potentially forage on if they can fly far enough. You know, it is still pretty chilly when they come mm. out. So they're not going to fly very far from the hive. But there are things like the Mahonia that you mentioned, uh, things like winter jasmine, um, some of the viburnums will flower in the winter, uh, Daphne, there's winter honeysuckles, all these things, you know, are potential sources. And of course, some of the um, bumblebees now are uh, being seen much more through the winter. They're not necessarily mm. hibernating. I think some of um, Bombus terrestris queens are quite often seen through the winter. Yeah. So having a source of food for them is also really important. And then, of course, the early flowering um, bulbs like snowdrop mm -hmm. and crocus are, are really important. Mm -hmm. But I think I would emphasise making sure that your bees go into the winter with enough stores rather than um, worrying about what they can forage on if they do fly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. OK, anyone want to add suggestions for planting? Well, I just think it makes so the beekeeper feel better. Um, um, I don't really think that you can plant enough to uh, make much different to difference to the bees. But um, I, I sort of endorse all the, um, the the list that Linford came up with. I would suggest winter aconites. Um, they're a lo lo lovely little plant anyway. And the great thing about them and snowdrops is that you don't have to um, plant great masses of them because they will um, spread very quickly on their own. Another one you might want to think about is um, um, uh, winter flowering clematis. Clematis, call it what you like. Mm. Mm. Oh, and the hellebores too. Did you mention hellebores? No, I didn't. No, no that's another good one. Mm. Oh, another one perhaps is Siberian squill, which is um, a, a, um, a, a strange little plant because you get blue pollen from it. Wow. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah. Mm. Good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, still sort of touching on winter, but winter bees. Um, Pat in Essex asks, what triggers the production of winter bees? <laughs> they have more fat bodies, but how does that arise? Is it the feeding or is it something that the queen influences? Um, Roger, would you like to? <laughs> no, Robert, then, would you like to have a start? <laughs> well, well I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll give, you, I'll, I'll give a crack at it, um, uh, if you like. Um, I probably don't know the answer. I'll just make a few comments. Um, I'm wondering if um, some of what we taught is um, it, it's actually a bit more complicated than that. And um, I'd like to chuck in a few thoughts, mainly for the other two to uh, make comment about. I'm wondering if perhaps um, what I come up with is I'm barking up the wrong tree. Um, honeybees presumably um, originated in sort of warm conditions or tropical uh, uh, conditions. Not sure how cold it was at the time, but then they moved out into various um, uh, uh, areas um, where they formed the subspecies that we know now. And um, the conditions there must have been quite a bit um, uh, uh, different, varying from really warm weather to right on the point of whether bees can uh, survive naturally or not because of the cold or um, lack of forage or whatever. Now, the research that's done on these sort of things, um, we tend to uh, accept without perhaps aren't asking too many questions. And um, I tend to ask a lot of, a lot of questions, as you know. Um, firstly, I'm wondering if the various subspecies um, do vary in some way, bearing in mind that they've evolved in different uh, climates. And I'm wondering if perhaps um, if you took the same subspecies and put them in varying um, uh, conditions, whether they will behave the same. Uh, I mean, they don't do it now, but I'm thinking perhaps of uh, days gone by when um, bees from California and Florida and places like Georgia were shipped up to Canada and uh, they tried to get them to the winter. Now, I've always understood that the trigger for um, a setting off winter bees is actually de declining pollen yeah. income. Whether that's correct or not, I don't know. Ah, sorry, we had a break there, Roger. Um, 
So I'm afraid we missed a bit of that. Where did uh, I get to? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, um, you, you okay, then if you, if you, if you've written in different uh, climatic conditions. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I've always understood that the trigger for um, uh, setting off the winter bees is the declining pollen income. Um, whether that's right or not, I don't know. But ask, asking questions again, I find that um, a little bit strange because certainly in my area, uh, we get plenty of pollen in late summer uh, and autumn. Mm. Um, and that's at a time when there's less brood reared anyway, so there's perhaps less need for it. And I asked the question, um, really, what happens when you get a dearth, um, whether a, a pollen shortage or perhaps bad weather, or even in a marginal area? Mm. So um, I think if, if ordinary beekeepers have got the same sort of information as me, there's lots of questions that we ought to be asking. And really, um, I think probably Robert and Linva um, will be able to answer answer questions better than me. So, so Robert, is there research on these areas? Uh, this isn't a well-researched area, which, which is a shame because it would be easily testable experimentally to take some colonies of winter bees in the middle of winter and take them down to a nice sunny climate and then just actually measure their, yeah. their life expectancy. And I suspect that what would happen is that it would be much shorter when you transport them to a warm area, uh, even though they were set up for winter in the United Kingdom, because what's really happening here is the bee is measuring its metabolic activity, which will be related to the work that it's doing and the pollen and nectar that it's processing. And it's building up fat stores um, in relation to that, that under, uh, chemical um, alliance with what's happening metabolically. I've looked at the brains of bees uh, throughout the winter period and compared them with the brains of bees in the summer. And what there's no sudden point at which their longevity is extended because the, the maturation of the brain and the aging changes in the brain are exactly proportional to 28 weeks as they would be to seven weeks in, in a summer bee. So what's happening is the whole metabolic process is being slowed down and, and it's probably being affected by lots of things that, that we don't yet understand. Nectar handling and pollen and temperature will all be part of that. But it, it's a key thing to actually test, uh, an easy thing to test. Uh, my expectation is that if you took winter bees with a 28-week life expectancy down to a nice warm place in the Canary Islands or somewhere on a December day, uh, they'd be quite happy and they'd revert to normal foraging, uh, but their life expectancy would then be reduced um, and they'd become more like summer bees because the bees are remarkably flexible. If you take all the young bees out of a hive, it's amazing how quickly the older bees oh, yeah. that, that have gone past the process of producing wax and feeding young will revert back to an earlier condition, almost being rejuvenated in the process uh, as they change their glands back into the glands required by nursing bees. So what you're seeing in bees preparing for the winter is a, a big metabolic exercise. And even bees in tropical countries have dearth periods that they have to get through. So it's a natural thing for the bees to adapt their met metabolic rate and the state of their food stores to the surrounding environmental circumstances. Anything you'd like to say, Linva? Well, yeah, I'm just that I'm aware of some work by Matilla and Otis. I think it was done back in the early 2000s that showed that it was a decline in pollen that triggers uh, the production of winter bees. But I don't think they really were able to work out what the mechanisms behind mm. that were. So, you know, while they were able to associate it to a drop in pollen levels, um, I'm not sure, you know, kind of what the processes behind it were. But, you know, it's, it's a fascinating process. And like Robert says, it just 
illustrates the adaptability of our bees. And, you know, obviously some strains seem to, or some races seem to do it better than others. You know, my bees are probably pretty native and, uh, you know, they generally overwinter very well and, and very frugally. So, you know, quite happy to, to be keeping those in the conditions that I've got around here. Mm. My, my understanding was that the, the fat body was sort of inversely proportional to the amount of feeding that they've had to do. And so at the end of the season, when the uh, the queen's laying rate reduces markedly, and there's very few mouths to feed, then the fat bodies build up um, for the winter period. But there you go. Well, then yeah, I'd, I'd, ask, I'd, ask, sorry, I'd ask Bob, why do, that doesn't happen in the spring when you've got the similar sort of situation? I I I I I know the um uh, I know the I know the no, yeah but they they're not feeding very much brood in the spring. Yes, they are. Oh, it's it's increasing, but when the queen is just starting to lay. Yes. Mm. Don't know. Okay. Okay. Um, how are we doing on time? I think we'll jump forward a little bit. Uh. Many beekeepers treat colonies with oxalic acid during the winter, historically around December and January. Is that too late now? The, the advice seems to lean towards a little bit earlier than that in November and December. Is it all about guessing that, uh, that broodless period? Uh, and that question comes from Jez in Kent. Who wants to start? Well, I'll, I'll have a crack then. Um, <laughs> I've over the years, I've taken ever so many um, uh, free living colonies out of trees and that sort of thing. Um, and certainly trees, it's generally going to be autumn onwards because the, 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 the leaves are, uh, are off the trees. And what I've always found is that if this brood, brood break is generally between early November and about mid-December, after about mid-December, the, the queens then start laying again. So that that's that's only ob obviously um, uh, observational information. But I've always felt that um, we're it's suggested that we use oxalic acid too late. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you there, Roger. I actually had a look in the colony the other day just to just to see, and and they were broodless. So I have rushed in with an oxalic acid treatment. Um, but uh, I would normally try and do it a little bit earlier than this yeah. and go for earlier in December. I think, though, probably if you've got fairly prolific queens, they may well be lying straight, straight through the winter and with, with, with no break. That's my guess. It, that is entirely possible now, particularly with the mild conditions that we've had this autumn. So I was quite surprised to find that this colony was broodless. Yes, you, you wouldn't want to let bees go into the winter carrying a varroa infestation. So um, at some point in the, in the autumn period, beginning of autumn, then if you had a really big varroa problem and you weren't trying to practice treatment-free beekeeping, which is another alternative, uh, but if you did want to treat them, then I would remove the, the brood from the colony and so there was no brood in the colony at all. And then I'd treat it with a conventional acaricide for two or three days, and that will kill every mite in the colony. Um, and any brood that's been taken out, I'll put in a little hospital colony, uh, several, well, more than seven miles away from, from the home apiary, where I would let them emerge there. And when they were all emerged, then I would uh, treat them with uh, an acaricide. Uh, so, there's no point in treating bees with chemicals if you're going to have to do it for a long period of time. Uh, you're just risking contaminating the colony. And it's much better to debrood the colony and get every mite killed before you go into the winter. And then the bees will have the best chance of surviving. Thank you. Um, Patricia in York, Yorkshire, um, she favours the Demery method of swarm control, but asks the panel, what is their favourite method of swarm control? Limva, how about you? What's your method? 
I don't use just one single method just to be awkward. Um, kind of depends. So I'm, I might use um, a vertical split. So maybe use something like a snail grove board, but not in the way that snail grove used it, um, just to split the colony. Um, the simplest method that I often resort to is literally just to put the queen in a nuke and take her out. Um, that, that tends to be, you know, the sort of fail safe method, particularly uh, if I'm running out of equipment, but I've still got a few spare nuke boxes. So it, it really does depend on how much equipment you've got available to you. Um, vertical splits are fine if you've got someone um, that is available to help you because lifting does become an issue with that method. So, you know, it, it just really depends on what system you're running, whether you work on your own and how much equipment you've got available. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Robert? Uh, well, Georges Demarie described this his own splitting method, I think, in about 1892 in the American Bee Journal. And uh, it's just one of many different splitting methods. I think the most important thing is to make sure that a beekeeper during training uh, un is educated to understand what the main facets yeah. of yeah. creation of the swarming impulse yeah. are. So then you can use umpteen different methods of splits yeah and uh, displacements to, to achieve uh, a satisfactory situation. For a colony not to want to swarm, first of all, the queen needs to be in a very good condition. And I've never seen a colony try to swarm in the year that it's been given a new queen. So the power of the queen pheromone in a new queen, a young queen, is, is very important. Then you've got to make sure there's plenty of space so they don't feel crowded. Um, you've got to have plenty of egg laying space for the queen, plenty of new comb, because queens like to lay eggs on new comb and not on old comb. Old comb is for receiving uh, nectar uh, for stores, and that minimizes the disease transmission to the new brood. So the queen will always look for new wax to lay her eggs in. So if you want to reduce your swarming risk, you make sure you've got plenty of new comb uh, in the colony. So uh, th these are the really important things. Um, and as long as you, you then realize that if you want to stop a swarming impulse occurring in short notice, you've really got to separate the very young bees from the very old bees. And, and there are, the Demery method is just one way of doing it. Um, another way of doing it is to put your hive in a wheelbarrow and wheel it 30 meters away from its flying position and leave some boxes in the flying position. And then when you open it in the wheelbarrow, all the old bees shoot back to, to the other side and, and you've just got a box full of very young bees uh, with the queen and you don't need to use smoke. You can examine it very carefully uh, and then you can set it up for queen rearing um, or the various things you can do once you've separated the old bees from the young bees. Once you've done that, they're very reluctant to swarm. So is that your method then? Wheelbarrow method? <laughs> That's the wheel. What's what I call the wheelbarrow displacement method. Because if you, do it, if you do it at the right time, it gives you a lot of young bees that you can use to put in queen rearing colonies. And it gives you old bees that, that are in the best possible condition for producing honey mm -hmm. because you've taken away all the brood and the young. So those old bees, their hypopharyngeal glands will turn into production of invitase. So there'll be maximum honey producers from that moment on. <laughs> If you've got 400 colonies, you need 400 wheelbarrows. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it's, it's only, I mean, it's not something you'd want to do with a large number. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Well, getting back to the question, uh, the question was uh, to do with swarm control. As I mm. understand it, the Demery method was never originally to do with swarm control. It was just a, 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 a management uh, tool, really. Mm. I've never ever done it um, as such. Um, I've done, obviously, variations on it. And, of course, there are variations on the, on the Demery uh, method, too. Um, uh, nobody yet's mentioned the artificial swarm, and I have to say, in very nearly 60 years of beekeeping, I've never ever done an artificial swarm for swarm control for myself. 
I've helped other people on occasions, um, and I've used the modified version uh, myself. What I tend to use is what I now call the Wakeford method, which is a very old uh, method, very simple. I have described it on uh, Cushman's website if anyone wants to look at that. It's, it's dead simple. And the great thing about it is you don't end up with um, with um, increase like the vast majority of swarm control methods do. Okay. Thank um, you. And we, we definitely recommend Wally Shaw's book uh, on mm. swarming. It's a really good book and it explains the application mm. of all these uh, principles. And it's just recently produced in the last two or three years. Yes, I, I, I certainly agree that uh, it's no good just having, to, you know, doing swarm control by rote, you know. No, no did not. No. Yeah, right. yeah. no good at all. all right. If you have to look at the book halfway through, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I, I just before we just uh, I I do a variation on yours, Limva. I, I if I run out of equipment, I just stick the queen with a cup full of her bees in an apidea, and uh, that, yes. yeah, and, and away we go. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. Um, what method of no, no, no. Yes, we're on to queen raising. So oh, this, this is an, an area where I know Roger's a, a lot of expertise. What method of queen raising would you uh, suggest for a beekeeper with two hives? And that comes from Larry all the way uh, away in Illinois, where it's afternoon. <laughs> Hello, <Cool>. Larry. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they, of course, have got different um, different situations than us. Um, but what, what, what was the question? Sorry, the... A method of queen uh, queen raising when a beekeeper's only got two hives. Oh right, well that's actually a very difficult group because um, mm. uh, it, many beekeepers are in that sort of level, and um, I find the problem with uh, queen rearing is that uh, the people immediately go in about three levels higher than most people want, and start talking about um, uh, grafting and um, cell plugs and all sorts of things like that. Um, personally, I think at that level, um, you could be, you should be um, uh, dealing with natural queen cells if you possibly can. What I ask is, please, 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 don't, don't, uh, don't buy queens because you, you can raise them yourself quite easily, and it's good fun doing it. <clears throat> uh, yes, you will get some that aren't particularly good, but you can also get some very, very good ones. Uh, I think you need to know first why you are replacing the queen um, or you need a new queen is it for temper or is it because they're a poor doer or simply because somebody said you've got to change your queens every two years or whatever um, i'm a great believer in beekeepers uh, assessing their colonies um, do it beforehand so you know when the time comes which ones you're you want to replace and those that you can uh, replace from obviously the better ones now, the business about two colonies, uh, quite honestly, I wouldn't start there anyway. Um, and um, uh, because um, we've got a lot of problems with queens uh, these days, you can very soon lose a queen. And if you've got only two colonies, if you lose one queen, all of a sudden you've lost 50% of your queens. I would usually try and keep an extra colony or a nuke as well. As much as anything, I'm a great believer in making up for winter losses before the winter happens rather than afterwards. Otherwise, you've only got one colony to try and make the, the, um, uh, make the increase from. Um, queen introduction, I find, is very much more difficult than it used to be. It's, it's, it's nowhere near as reliable. So if you possibly can... Um, try and get the queens to emerge um, and get mated from a colony that she's going to, to, to head um, uh, because then that cuts out one of the problems. If you've got 5, 10, 20 colonies, if you lose a queen, it doesn't matter too much. But if you've only got two in the first place and you lose one, um, then it's, um, it's, um, it's quite a loss. And... Queens are more valuable the, uh, the lower the number of colonies you've got, um, I find. So mm -hmm. I would use uh, natural queen cells. Um, there are too many options uh, for me to give here because, uh, of course, I, I don't know the situation of the, mm -hmm. um, of the questioner or 
um, anybody else that's listening, but the two ones, two that come to mind, as form control, like we've just uh, mentioned, uh, very often you can um, you can have a good colony that's preparing to swarm. Use the queen cells. In my experience, in my view, they're absolutely fine. Mm. If you can't do that, then um, I would certainly use uh, emergency cells. You need to be a little bit more careful with emergency cells, but um, uh, that's what um, that's what I will go for. Um, but as I say, I think it's uh, we just haven't got time to to discuss any sort of techniques here. Options, but essentially, Roger, you're saying take take a nuke, go into winter with three colonies, and then, um, yeah, uh, yeah, choose from the best next year, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Limva. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with Roger. You know, you're you're in a difficult position if you've only got two colonies. But I would never want to discourage someone from having a go at queen rearing. It no, gets labelled as wrong. difficult, and it really isn't. And I'd really recommend that you just give it a go. So if you are in the situation where you've only got one or two colonies, then try and make some friends and just come together as a small group <laughs> and you know work as a group and give it a go. And that has so many benefits because you know, you're any risk is kind of spread across the whole group. You can sort of share your resources and also, you know, input and share people's ideas and, you know, hopefully take on the responsibility together. So that's what I would be tempted to do if I only had a couple of colonies. Do you want to add anything to that, Robert? Well, in answer to the specific question, the, what's the simplest way of going forward? The obvious thing is, to, is to manage the colony you're going to use uh, so that it, it occupies one, one brood box, which makes life easier, and then just simply take five frames out of that one box and put them in a nucleus box, making sure you've got at least one frame of honey, uh, preferably two frames containing stores. You've got definitely one frame with eggs, uh, and you've got uh, then the bees that were sitting on them. And you don't need to bother looking for the queen because uh, if you divide uh, a colony like that in a couple of days time, you'll see where the queen was because one of them will have queen cells and the other one won't. <laughs> uh, so it's not, if you're going to do this in the simplest way, don't bother looking for the queen and disturbing the colony and risking damaging the queen. Take five frames out with the right mixture. Make sure you've got eggs in the frames you take out and make sure you're leaving eggs behind in, in the box that you're bisecting. Uh, and then I'd move that, that nucleus box I'd just created more than seven miles away from the home apiary. So it keeps some of its flying bees as well. And, and that's probably the simplest way of making an increase with a minimum amount of work. And I would just let the, uh, the, the small nucleus requeen itself. If they produce excess queens, the queens will fight and one of them will take over. Uh, if a colony is very large, the colony will keep alive several virgin queens, and then you've got the swarming risks. But if a colony is very small, they won't keep alive more than a couple of queens, and so they can sort themselves out. And uh, that's the minimum amount of, of trouble, I would say, in making an increase. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is basically what the Americans call a walkaway split. Yeah. Okay, and it's good for an Ameri in an American environment because normally you've got much better weather, uh, so that, that there's a good chance that the Virgin Queen will be mated. Whereas in Britain, the choice of the weather period will be very critical. You, you notice, Bob, what uh, Roberts just suggested: we're up to three colonies. So, you know, <laughs> sticking to, stick to two colonies isn't always that easy. No, no. Well, that's got to be the minimum number, hasn't it? It's got mm. to be the minimum number for a beekeeper to keep. They are a good advice there, Larry. I hope that uh, that helps you. I've got loads of questions here, and um, we're not getting through them at the rate I. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to miss a few out. Uh, I'm going to go on to a few um, to do with equipment, which are going to be, I hope, more generally. Um, applicable um and a very straightforward question really how do panelists store their extracted supers over winter uh who wants to start on that one how about robert well i can give you an easy answer to this because 
I don't like messing about with extracting uh, using radial systems. So at the end of the season, I crush my cones completely um, mm. and run the honey out. And, uh, and then I melt down the beeswax and then I produce new combs for the next season. Um, so I, if, if you want to store combs that have been in a, a tangential extractor, for example, uh, and they're wet, the only safe way to store them is really to, to put them into a chilled environment, into a refrigerator, uh, as the Canadians do. Uh, but but why take that risk of uh, of the the combs going manky because you didn't store them in the right place and they've got a bit of mold on them or something, um, mm -hmm. and and why take the risk of giving them back to the colony too late in the season when the colony can't clean them up properly? So another risk of fungus. So I like the idea of just crushing the 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 combs at the end of the year, and um, because then I can make sure that my bees don't have any comb in any colony that's more than two years old. Um, yeah. So that, that crushed wax I'll melt down and use for candles and ornaments and gifts to people and then make foundation with it for, for the next season. I don't let, like any comb in the colony to be more than two years old. That mm -hmm. just accumulates disease and it upsets the queen. There's a lovely experiment you can do where you cut old comb and new comb into two inch squares and then put them in a frame in alternating like a checkerboard. And if you do that, you'll see the queen will lay eggs in the new squares and the workers will put honey or create nectar stores in the old squares, even though you've made it a patchwork quilt. <laughs> <laughs> They're very precise about what, where they want the queen to lay eggs in the most disease free condition. Well, I don't think there's many people who store their supers that way, Robert. How about you? <laughs> I don't suppose you crush everything. No, I don't. I've got 30 hides and I'm definitely not crushing all them every year. Um, yeah, so I give the supers back to the colony they came from straight after extraction and let them clean them out. And then they go into my shed and I store them with newspaper between each super and then with a lid on the top um, and that's where they sit all winter and then when I take them out of storage I'll treat them with acetic acid before they go out oh. back out to the apiary. That's good. Hmm. I, quite different from what I do. I, 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 don't, um, <laughs> I don't let queens lay in super combs anyway um, so um, I, I haven't got that problem. Um, I just like uh, Linva, uh, I let the bees clean uh, clean them up afterwards and then I store them outside in a stack. <laughs> and um, uh, the what you find is the, the, there's no problem with the wax moth during the winter. They're just stored, stored outside. Isn't that funny? There's four of us and we all do it very differently. <laughs> I don't I don't give the supers back to the bees to clean out. I, I, I stack them straight away wet. Um, with acetic acid. I make a great big stack, a jar of, of acetic acid at the bottom, 10 supers high, clown board on the top and a brick, and, and that's yeah. it, and they're fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. What uh, so how, have we satisfied the, the questioner? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was David in um, Have a Point West. Have a Ford West, have sorry. A have a Ford West. Yeah which is in Wales, I believe. Um, right. This one's from Archie in, in Kent. He says, bees in natural cavities, such as a hollow tree, uh, are well insulated and only have one small entrance. Does this inform your decisions about your hives on matters such as solid or mesh floors, entrance size, insulation and ventilation? Who would like to start with that one? Limfa, I think I'll ask you. Yeah, so it does influence my decision, actually. Um, I do use mesh floors because that helps with my integrated pest management for varroa control. But the entrance block that I use on my hives, I keep relatively small. So even at the height of summer, when the colony might be really big, 
mm. um, they're still only accessing through the same size hole that they would in the winter. And I don't remove the entrance block or widen it out. I might go maybe just to three inches long, but um, certainly not the full length of the uh, front of the hive. Mm. Um, and in the winter, it'll definitely be down to more like an inch. Mm. Okay. So uh, it does influence me in that respect. Right. How about insulation? Insulation. I'm I'm on wooden hives. Personally, I don't like polystyrene. Um, and in the winter, I do put an inch thick layer of Kingspan on top of the crown board. Mm. Um, but I don't wrap anything around the hives. Yeah. Okay. How about you, Robert? They like to be warm, obviously, and I think ma making sure they're well insulated is important. One thing bees don't like is top ventilation. <laughs> if you put a crown board with a perforated zinc on top of a brood nest for the winter period, they'll, they'll fill it with propolis as quickly as they can. If you give them any top ventilation and they can get to it, they'll block it off. So it's quite clear that, that bees don't like top ventilation during the winter. They like to control the humidity within the cavity that, that, that they're nesting. And they can't do that if there's top ventilation creating a through draft. Um, so I think definitely you can see that trees, uh, uh, bees in trees, uh, manage completely without any problem, uh, without any top ventilation. And the tree is a perfect insulator. Um, so yes, you can learn a lot from looking at natural columns. Roger? Um, well, um, there was a book written on that once, on the ventilation of beehives. <laughs> um, <clears throat> right, I'm different than the others. Um, now, what I do is I leave the feed hole open so they do get through ventilation. I'll answer um, Robert's point about the um, perforated zinc. I suspect the bees are closing it off because I feel they can't um, can't defend it. But I but but I, I, I don't really know. Um, and it's interesting that um, uh, about ten years ago, the Whisper Green teaching apiary. Um, somebody challenged me on, on this, and I said, well, I'll tell you what we do. We'll take 10 colonies, uh, or so, sorry, 20 colonies. We we'll split them into two groups of 10, and we'll check to see what the, um, uh, what the results are in the spring. And we made sure they were, they were fairly equal. So we had um, uh, 10 colonies with the um, uh, feed holes closed off, and 10 with them open. And uh, the results in the spring um, surprised us. There was virtually no difference in the strengths coming through the uh, uh, winter. What we did find was where there was no um, uh, no covering on the um, uh, uh, on the top of the crown wall. What we found was like it was a blue bloom all the way across the, the tops of the frames, which presumably was some sort of fungus. Yet the ones that were open were clear, but more importantly. What we did notice was there was a lot more chalk brood where the where the um, hives had been closed off at the top than where, where they'd been been open. So um, I think that that sort of confirmed that what I was doing wasn't doing the bees that much harm. But you know, it's not really a scientific experiment. Um, Mm. You know, we've all got different a, ways of doing things. Yeah, it's a difficult one, that, because if, mm. if they're in an ordinary uh, national hive um, and it's very cold at the top, uh, then, of course, you're going to get condensation and uh, you probably wouldn't get that as at the wrong time of the year for bees in, inside a mm. tree because the insulation in the tree would be so much better. Um, so a lot of the problem is... That, we're always putting bees into situations that they wouldn't choose for themselves. Uh, and, and a lot of the problems that we have, like chalk brood, are related to the fact that, that, that we're not being wise enough about the way in which we set up the colonies for the winter and the sorts of conditions that, that we give them. And there's no doubt for a tropical creature like Apis mellifera, um, it, it puts a high value on insulation and maintenance of temperature. 
and it likes an environment that it can control itself. It doesn't like external factors being in control. Mm. Yeah, Rob, Rob has just reminded me we got um, we got different situation because in a tree they're normally eight or ten feet um, or uh, more yes. um, off the ground, and it's right. a lot drier than it is at, gra at ground level. That's right. Mm. Yeah, you've got you've got to keep your beehives certainly in the United Kingdom. You've got to keep your beehives off well off the ground, two or three foot off the ground to get away from that moist, wet air that, that, that builds up in, in the United Kingdom during the winter and, and causes so much trouble for the bees. Sorry, and clear the vegetation away. Yes, yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, thank you. That, that question came from Archie in Kent and we've got a question here from Jeremiah in County Cork. Um, what do the panellists think of plastic foundation? Linford doesn't like plastic hives, but what do you think about plastic foundation? No. <laughs> I thought that might be a no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm really not a fan. Just why would you want to put plastic in your hives? The bees can do it far better. So it's wax every time for me. The, I just I have no experience of plastic foundation. But one of the things that concerns me about plastic is how it would impact on the bees' ability to communicate with each other. The wax is a really good um, conductor of their signals, whether that be their chemical pheromones or any vibrations. And I just wonder how plastic is going to impact on that. So, yeah, for me, no, you won't find plastic foundation in my hives. <laughs> Robert. Uh, yeah, I don't use plastic foundation, but it, it does have plastic uh, does have uses if you're mass producing queens. Because as Limber says, the bees leave messages and signals to one another in the wax, particularly in the rim of wax around the top of a queen cell, which determines whether the queen cell will be developed or not, and determines whether a larva in it will be fed or eaten. Um, and of course, if you were grafting lots of larvae, you, you'd like to be able to control the messages on the outside of the queen cup. So I've got some plastic uh, queen cups here and uh, the acceptance rate in these is, is incredibly high uh, when you're mass producing queens. And it's because if you use hot water on these uh, plastic queen cups before, before you uh, employ them, uh, then you, you get rid of any contamination and there are no hidden signals to the bees at all. And the bees will then add a rim of wax with, with their own signals in it. And their acceptance rate is very high. So the bees seem to be quite happy with plastic. But of course, once you've got plastic foundation, then it makes the handling of uh, all other processes quite difficult. Um, and uh, I prefer normal wax uh, foundation and comb for normal beekeeping but there's just a special application there I think in queen's queen yeah. mass queen production yeah. where you can uh, uh, get a real advantage by using plastic queen cells and and it you can make them very hygienic in the process if you're going to produce 80 queens a day you, you definitely need need to maximize the acceptance rate and if you haven't seen those before I don't know if I can show you them yeah. If people haven't seen them, they're really useful for queen rearing. Jay-Z Bees one. Jay-Z Beezy. Jay-Z Beezy. Well, boy, I've, um, I've got a pretty open mind about uh, uh, most things, um, but I I have to say I didn't like the sound of um, Plastic Foundation, but at um, Whisper Green Teaching Night Breeze, it's all six years ago now, I think, one of our members said... Um, uh, can we can we try some plastic foundation? So yep, okay. Bought forty sheets of it, and um, I have to say um, I um, I'm not 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 a great fan of it. Um, bees will normally put holes in combs, and I think they use it for a uh, communication. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, they can't do that with plastic foundation. Um, if you want to cut out queen cells and things like that, it's not very not not very easy. Um, and we did a little experiment where we alternated uh, wax foundation and plastic, and the bees preferred the wax foundation. Now, that, in human terms, told me they prefer 
the uh, the wax foundation uh, uh, anyway. Um, so I'm I'm not uh, I'm not a great lover in it, and none in my hives, and I shan't. Uh, so sorry, that thumbs down <laughs> for, for <laughs> plastic <laughs> foundation. <laughs> Look, we, we're um, we're running out of time here, uh, so I'm going to jump to one which may. Uh, I, I just I need two answers from everyone here. What um, what change to your beekeeping practices or purchase of a piece of equipment made such a difference that you said, "Gosh, I wish I'd learned about that or bought that piece of equipment years ago." What so those life changing <laughs> um, <laughs> practices or purchases. Robert. Right. Well, um, for for day to day beekeeping, this is the uh, this is the the gadget that I most appreciated getting, which is a queen catcher, uh, and this is a plastic one. But I, I used to have glass ones made, um, and you just get your queen into there, and she runs up into the tube, and there's no problem. You can put your thumb over the end, and you can walk away. And then when you get into a greenhouse or a hut, you can put <laughs> a little plug in like that. Um, and then you can slide the needle of a carbon dioxide dispenser into the bottom here. So you can anesthetize the queen nice and safely. So when you've anesthetized her, you can take the, the cork out and tap it on the table. And then you can examine the queen. You can mark her really carefully. Uh, the carbon dioxide rolls off the table because it's heavier than air, so you're not going to kill the queen with too much anaesthetic. Um, and then if you're going to clip the queen, you've got plenty of time to remember to clip just on one side and clip the largest wing on one side and don't take off more than a millimeter. Uh, and you can do a really careful operation. And then you can put the queen into an introduction cage to put, put her back in the colony as she recovers. Uh, so that that's my most useful bit of kit that changed my life <laughs> when I started beekeeping. And then for advanced beekeeping, this is the most useful bit of kit uh, for queen rearing. And it's the Genta egg production cage where you put your queen in the front here and there's a queen excluder that allows the workers to look after her. And then in the back here, you've got removable bottoms to the cells. So she lays an egg in here overnight, and then you've got 90 eggs that you can pull out where there's one egg in the bottom of each cell. And then you can put that into a plastic queen cup and you get the very best possible queens mm. if you start from eggs rather than larvae. That, so that's the Genta, the Genta egg production cage, which is really useful for advanced beekeeping. Linva. Well, I honestly can't think of a piece of equipment that's kind of revolutionized my beekeeping. But the one thing that has definitely made an impact has been education. And I, as you know, as you're all very aware, I went through the BBKA system, did all the modules, became a master beekeeper, and then went on and did my national diploma. And as I worked through the modules in particular, I could see an improvement in my beekeeping standards. You know, it was really quite tangible. Mm. So you do, even if you choose not to do exams, and I completely understand why you might choose not to, mm. don't stop learning um, because it will improve your beekeeping. And, you know, when I think back, you know, 15 years ago, how I was keeping my bees and perhaps, you know, how much honey I was getting or how many losses I was having. The, the difference now is it's chalk and cheese. So definitely just keep learning. And it doesn't stop now either. No. <laughs> OK, well, that's yes, I think we all recognise that um, we never know it all, do we? And we're working with, with livestock that, um, that never do exactly what you expect. <laughs> right. Well, we've, um, I think, come to the end. Of, don't, don't mind then. What about Roger? Oh, yeah. sorry, did I not ask you, Roger? Yes. I beg your pardon. Oh, we want to, want, want to know Roger's tips. Yeah. yeah. The worst well, thing's happened to me. Bob was meeting you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> uh, my two are um, uh, firstly um, uh, starting to use thymolized syrup, putting thymol in syrup. Um, when I had a lot of colonies, what I found was that I had to feed them quickly. And if you feed them a little bit on the late side, you end up with a lot of syrup that isn't sealed because there's no income for the bees to produce the wax to, to seal. So mm. um, it, it fermented. Um, so I started using timelized uh, syrup. And um, what it's also done is the usual black sludge that you get in um, uh, in the bottom of feeders that that you, you just don't get that. Also, you can keep syrup from one year to the next. So I think that's mm. that certainly helped me a lot. Um, I've got um, I've got it on Cushman's website if anybody wants to um, uh, wants to make up the um, the the, um, uh, the mixture. That's one thing. The other thing is well, uh, a little gadget, and I do not normally cool. like gadgets. A little gadget called Waggle Wedge. Now we all know the little trick about putting a wedge in um, when you're lifting supers off. Well, one time a day I could lift. Uh, four supers off now it's uh, certainly half that um and um uh wedges i've always found a bit of a nuisance because they drop out and they fall on the ground you lose them all the rest of it this waggle wedge uh which was uh, designed uh, by a man called jonathan brookhouse he calls himself two brook bees if you want to check it out um and i'm not, I'm not selling these things but he's 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 modified it so there's a nice little stop on there so you can push the uh, push the wedge in and it doesn't fall out and it, uh, all you do then is just waggle it back and forwards uh, it gently lowers the um, supers and you don't crush any bees mm. so I've only started using them I suppose about four, five years or so ago but I find them much easier especially now I find lifting a bit more difficult mm. thank you that that question was from Robert Smith of Kent. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my my biggest uh, sort of ping idea, well, dawning of uh, why did, on earth didn't I do that earlier? Was the discovery of manly frames in supers because <laughs> oh. I don't like uncapping. Uh, and manly frames make it so much easier. Anyway, there we go. Thank you so much, panel. Um, really entertaining answers um and i hope useful to our audience tonight um so i will pull it to a close there wish everyone a very happy christmas uh and a prosperous new year and um i'll close with some uh information on the things that we've got coming up so thank you very much panel good night everyone thank you good night good night, good night. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. There we go. Thank you. So, um, yes, in January, we have uh, Jacob Podesta from the University of York um, talking to us about ants. We haven't had a, uh, the remit of the, uh, the Central Association of Beekeepers is really... Uh, I mean, principally towards honeybees, but of course, also um, we we like to have a representative of all the uh, hymenoptera. So we often have um, talks on bumblebees and occasionally hornets, but seldom ants. So uh, I'm quite looking forward to this one. It's about the, the way in which um, practices. Sorry, let me go back. The way in which. Um, whoops. I'm sorry, this this is advancing when it shouldn't be advancing. <laughs> Got it right. Um, oh. There we go. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so this one's about the way in which management practices in um, the woodlands on the North York Moors influences the dispersion of ants. It's quite fascinating by the sound of it. You can book that one and this one as well this is from Alison McAfee of North Carolina State University um, in the states obviously North Carolina and she's going to be talking to us about drones and that's in February and then in March we have we are having um, a spring meeting this year we had our spring meeting in Nottingham and uh, in March we've got one in Cheshire 
uh, which uh, we hope will be well supported. Um, speakers have been provisionally um, assigned. So we've got some people talking about bumblebees. Um, Raquel's going to be talking about honeybee nutrition. And uh, Professor Steve Martin is going to be with us as well. We haven't um, finalised his topic yet. So that's our spring meeting in March. And um, and then after a, a break of several years because of COVID, of course, um, we are talking about having an autumn conference next year, which would be um, probably Saturday and Sunday morning. And we're looking at the 25th and 26th of November and possibly um, a conference centre in the Malvern Hills. Uh, so if that sounds interesting to you, please keep an eye on the website and uh, all of the other things can be booked from there. So I'll just leave you with that one. So thank you very much, everyone. And um, again, happy Christmas and good night. Good night, Bob. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, good night everyone. Thank you.